Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, <clears throat> class today. I hope that uh, you guys are here. I didn't have a countdown timer because I was messing around with the uh, green screen because uh, I forgot I had a light that was pointed badly earlier, and it looked really weird. So I was messing with it, but then I realized, like, oh, wait, that light isn't pointed right. So I think it looks okay now. I mean, I still got that weird thing in my eye, but I think we're good. <clears throat> so, uh, cool. Um, hello, hello. So, uh, a bit of an aside here. I feel really good today because I caught some people that were cheating. And they didn't actually cheat in your guys' class. They cheated in Summer 2's uh, CS135, actually. Um, so this is, I guess, a warning, yeah, is that just because you get away with cheating uh, and the semester ends doesn't mean that you really got away with it because uh, you can always get caught in the future. So don't cheat and don't use Chegg because Chegg is pretty easy to uh, work with to get information. So, yes. Uh, anyways, yeah, yeah. Good times, good times, actually. So, oh, even my dog is like, oh, well, better go change my answers before they catch me. No. Um, so, you guys got to see on uh, Thursday the operator overloading video, so, or set of videos, so uh, I will not talk about operator overloading this week then, because we already talked about it. What I will do is I will continue what I was talking about with the dynamic memory allocation stuff. So, uh, we'll pick up from that, and then this, this, should, uh, this should pretty much prepare you to do assignment 5, which is a remake of assignment 1. Uh, what that means is that if you uh, got 100% in assignment 1, then you still got to do assignment 5, but it's only worth 100 points for you. If you get less than 100% in assignment 1, uh, this assignment is worth 100 points, but if in the process of doing assignment 5, you fix the issues in assignment 1, then you can get those points back as well. So it's kind of like a redo. Uh, so you can't do worst. So like, if, if let's say you don't even do assignment 5. Uh, you will only lose 100 points, but uh, it's your chance more of like to redeem your points from the previous assignment. So, also I went to UNLV and I got my binder for uh, with with the book too. Well, printed version of the book. It's weird. They, how they give it to you? But uh, more importantly, I want to get my notes and pointers. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and pop open here. Assuming that it's hopefully around here. Uh, here we go. Okay, so there's that. Okay, does anybody have any questions, by the way, on operator overloading stuff? If you do, you can try to ask them here or you can ask on Discord. Okay, I got it. So, let me go ahead and just take out this whole folder here and then I'll put this here just so it's not on camera so it doesn't look weird on the green screen so a lot of this is just uh, websites printouts like stack overflow this is literally stack overflow printout so uh, it's what I have in class this is I may not have internet to show you guys and then you can go home and google it but for pointers I actually took the time to do real lecture notes and so I'm gonna kind of pick up what I was talking about pointers <coughs> and uh, take it from there I wish I could share these on like a projector but uh, here it'll be on video so I'll just scan it slowly and then you'll be able to see them how about that that's actually a good idea I'll do that and you can check the YouTube video later and I'll talk over them but you can use the YouTube video later to uh, to basically get a copy if you'd like. Now this is very uh, antiquated for a CS professor, but uh, can't bother to scan them. So this is more of like being nice. Okay, and I think that's that's pretty much it. The next one is just a page from uh, from the, from the book, like printout. Their pages seven ninety eight through. 800 okay so you can check those out that's when they talk about the operator name okay but uh, anyways from this stuff uh, first we already talked about what the ampersand the address of operator is and all of that and uh, 
pointers. So yeah, we'll pick up from here. So, so far, and we have done, where can I put this actually? I guess I'll put it over here. So like this, and I'll just bring in the page that I'm working on. So now I'm gonna be working on page two, okay? So, so far, I've shown you how to basically create individual pointer variables, right? So like int ptr gets new int, right? And this is a pointer variable. And it's not just any pointer variable, it's an integer pointer variable, right? That's why sometimes it's easier to put the asterisk next to this to kind of make it easier to see that this is an integer pointer, okay? So, uh, yeah. And so, the uh, what I want to show you now is, before we continue talking about new and delete and malloc, and, and I know you already kind of had to do malloc in the assignment because of the fortunate switching of the schedule around, but uh, I'll still go over it a little bit in case you're still rusty on it. But I did have the examples on Canvas showing how to use it. So, um, but before that, I want to show you how to create pointer variables inside of classes, since this, after all, is an object-oriented programming class, right? So, uh, it's a little bit tricky, and there's a shortcut to, to take advantage of that I want to talk about. So, normally, you know, if I want to, first of all, let's talk about making an object of a class. That one, that one should be trivial because uh, you did it in the assignment. So suppose that I got a struct or a class called st, which is student type. And in that class, I have a double GPA. And maybe we make it public. So we don't have to do it. Get her and set her. So we could have just made a struct, I guess. But anyways, so we have that, okay? So on main, if you want to create an object of this class, you know we can do this, right? So student type S. And so now S is an object. And if we want to access uh, the GPA inside of S, we know we can do basically S dot GPA equals uh, well, 5.0 is not a real GPA, so that would be a 3.9. Right? Smart guy or girl. Um, so that's hopefully all of review. But uh, so now, what if we wanted to make a pointer of an object? Well, you just do the same thing you did before. You basically just throw in the asterisk there, and then you could make it something like sptr, you know, call it something else. And you can't name it the same variable name. And then you can, if you wanted to point to s, you can do something like sptr equals the address of s, right? And that will store the address of s in sptr okay so now if i wanted to um well if i wanted to copy s into another variable so if i had another one like sts2 you know i could do this but if i wanted to copy it using my pointer i could also go ahead and do s2 equals the reference sptr right not address of, but the reference, because this is a pointer. And remember, uh, the address of operator gets you the address of whatever you're passing it with, so the operand. And the reference is the opposite. It goes to the address. In fact, something that I said on Discord over the weekend was you can actually kind of cancel them out. So if I have an integer b here, and I go ahead and say c out b, we know that's going to print out whatever b contains, right? So if b contains a 20, then this will print out, print out basically 20, right? Uh, if we go ahead and say see out address of B, then that's gonna print out the address of B, the hexadecimal value of where B lives, that address, right? Uh, well, what would it even mean if we did something like this? What would that try to do? Just question for you guys on chat. What would happen if I tried to do this? And this is not a pointer, it's just a regular variable. Well, what? What would the computer try to handle this as? Like, what would happen? You know, it might even not even compile, actually. But if it did, what would it be trying to do? What would it see out, basically? I'll take it up more, like, LOL. Uh, so. Anybody? Still 20? 
No, it would not print 20 out. It will try to find the value at address 20. Very correct. Well done. Well done there. That's right. So yes, if you try to do C out asterisk 20, what's going to happen is it's going to dereference basically what 20 contains. So 20, you know, it's a number in binary and uh, it basically can be converted that into hexadecimal as well. So basically it's going to try to access address uh, 20 in hex, which actually would not be two zero. It would be one, uh, one four, I think, because one zero would be 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, so 20. So it would actually address 0, 014, which is actually address 20 in decimal. So yes, it would try to find the value there. So, <clears throat> you know, more than likely it would check fault. But, you know, if there was no protections, in theory, it would go to that address in memory and get whatever is there and interpret it as, well, again, this is kind of weird because there's no type involved here, but, you know, it might interpret as an integer, I would think. But again, this would probably not even compile because it would tell you that B is not a pointer. But maybe with that permissive, it would. But anyways, that's what it would try to do. So I'm glad that you guys actually understand that that's what it would try to do. Is basically try to consider uh, B as an address and go there. Cool. All right. So we know that this is bad, right? If, if it's not a pointer, at least. However, what do you think this will do? And this is what I basically posted on uh, Discord over the weekend. What would that see out? So I got an asterisk, an ampersand, and then my variable that's not a pointer. So what would the, be the output of this? <coughs> 20. 20. God, yay, you guys got it. Right. It is indeed 20 because here's what happens. First, you know, we're going from basically, uh, you can think of it like th in this direction. You start with, start with, the, uh, with the B. And basically, the ampersand gets the address of B. So, you know, somewhere in memory, let's say address 500, you have the 20, right? So ampersand of B is going to get that address. And then the referencing is going to basically say, go to that address again. So they basically cancel each other out. It's like antimatter versus matter or something. So ultimately, they cancel each other. And so this is the same thing as just doing B. So if you want to just confuse somebody, Instead of doing this line of code, you could do this line of code and freak them out and be like, what the heck are you doing? Because uh, that's exactly what's going to happen there. So, uh, yeah, they cancel each other out. So it's, if you have a hard time understanding the difference between the address of operator and the dereference operator, uh, really try playing around with this stuff to kind of see how they are basically the opposite thing. You know, one of them gets you the address, the other one goes to the address. And so it's kind of like a circle. You could probably chain these into like multiple... Uh, instances of that probably I, I think you could probably get away with doing something like this and then so i think that would basically be the same thing as 20. this would get the 20 out this would get the address of 20 i suppose if it's an address yeah so i think that would do that we can try it out in a little bit in the code here where's my mouse So let's go ahead and make our int b gets 20. And then from there, let's go ahead and, oh man, this looks weird. Oh, interesting. Okay. So uh, c out b, we know that's going to give us 20. But now let's have some fun. So we're going to do the asterisk and the ampersand. So we know that's going to hopefully, well, it should give us 20. The one that, that we're kind of hopeful about is this one as well that should give us 20 so that's the one that we were mostly interested in trying out and so there you go 20 indeed and you could probably do this forever so like if you really want to go crazy just for memes twenty so uh please don't do this <laughs> in your assignments <laughs> there's no reason to ever do that but you know practice play with it you know try this at home play it play with it so you can get a better feel for mixing around with the reference operator and the address of operator as well okay so anyways back to uh back to the ipad so 
Okay, so we know that we basically can create a pointer to an object, but here's the thing. So let me uh, let me actually kind of bring this down, or actually, I'll just move this away. So I'll just put this like down here for now. Okay. There we go. So. This is what we were doing. We were we had a class and we <coughs> we created a, a pointer to a student type, and then we got the address of that pointer. I'm sorry, of that object, and we made a we made it point to that. So essentially, we have s the object s, and then we have a sptr pointing to it as well. And then we created s2, which made a copy of s, and then um, the way that it did the copy is it technically went through here. To get it, so it went to SPTR and then to, to S, which then copied it over. And we'll talk about the different ways of copying things in a minute here. Be deep versus shallow as well. But yeah, so but here's the thing though. Normally, as I said, if you want to access the GPA of, of S, you do S dot GPA, right? You do this. However, how would you do that for the pointer? That's the real question here. So you know, ignoring the fact that we have S2, we don't need this right now. If we just have SPTR here, SPTR is pointing to S, right? And we know that S is GPA, we can do this. The, the question now is, can we do something like this to access the GPA, right, of SPTR, which should give us a, basically the pointer of the 2.9? The and the answer is no, you can't just do this because again, this is a pointer. And when you're trying to access data from a pointer, you have to dereference the pointer. So you have to put an asterisk in front of it. But that's not enough because now you run into a different problem. This dot here is known as the member access operator. And again, this is the dereference operator. And it turns out that between the member access operator and the dereference operator, there's different priority or what is known as operator precedence, right? Operator precedence is the concept like when you have a, a, a math a very complex mathematical computation of this type here. You know, you have two plus five times five. You know, what do we do? Do we uh, do seven times five? Two plus seven is five, seven times five, or do we do two plus 25, right? Because uh, this one's gonna give us 35, and this one's gonna give us 27, right? So it's ambiguous in that sense, or at least it would be if there wasn't the operator precedence, which basically tells us that if we have a situation like this, we always multiply before we add, right? There's that order of precedence. So we have, in math, it's like exponents go, parentheses go on top, then exponents, then multiplication, division, then, then addition, subtraction as well. And also up there in the category, I suppose, beneath parentheses would be negative in front of digits as well. So this operator precedence carries over to C++ and programming as we have used in 135, right? But you also apply that similar concept to other operators that are not mathematical based, such as the member access operator and the, the, the reference operator. So before, you know, moving a little bit from this, if I had something like a class A and that class A happened to have ST, uh, a student in it, so ST, you know, uh, we'll call this S. So it has a student called S as well, right? And again, make it public. If we're trying to access the GPA of the student, do something like a dot s dot GPA. Well, actually not capital A, but suppose that we in main we make an object lowercase a, 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 so then you do a dot s dot GPA, right? And in this case, again, here it's like, which way do we go? And so what's happening is it's saying the member of a, which is s, and the member of s, which is GPA, right? And that works because it's going from left to right. Now, here's the thing. Here, the compiler, or you should ask yourself, what should you do first? Should you run the dereferencing first? Or should you run the member accessing first? And what you want to do is you want the dereferencing to happen first. Because first, you need to dereference the SPTR. So first, you want this to run so that you go to the address of the object S. And then once you're there, then you can do the arithmetic shifting that the member access does to get to the GPA class variable. 
Okay, because basically you can think of, which is actually plus zero in this case because it's the first member variable in the class, actually. But uh, if, if there was two variables, if we had like an integer here called uh, uh, age, you know, and we wanted to get age, then that would be basically a plus eight. So the point is that the, the reference operator needs to happen before the member access operator. However, it turns out that in C++, the member access operator has higher precedence. So if you just type what I had originally put here, which again was just the asterisk sptr.gpa, what happens first is it first tries to go to GPA from sptr, so it assumes that sptr is a regular object, not a pointer, and then tries to do the arithmetic shifting to get to GPA uh, in, as, as a member, and then it dereferences that value that is in, in GPA and takes it as, a, as an address. So, which is kind of like the bad thing that we were doing earlier here. And so, because of that, we have to add parentheses to get this to work. Just like we would if we wanted to make sure the addition happened first here, right? We would just add those parentheses. So, you have to do parentheses sptr dot gpa. And now, that'll actually work. That'll actually get you to the gpa. Because first, you're going to go to the address of the object that you have this pointer to. And then, once you're there you can go ahead and get the member uh, variable, okay? Now, this can get pretty nasty because let's go ahead and suppose that we have an object inside another object which happens to also be a pointer, okay? So let me give you that scenario's code. Uh, actually, that one we'll type in the computer because then we can play around with it. So let's do that. So suppose that you have, I'll use a struct just so I don't have to keep writing public. And you guys know now that structs and classes are the same thing. So we're gonna have class A, or struct A, is going to have inside of it, uh, or actually we'll just have a struct A and it's gonna have an int x in it, okay? And we can initialize, now nah, we don't initialize. Next we're gonna have a struct B, and it's gonna use aggregation. So it's gonna have inside of it a tiny little struct of A. We're gonna call that uh, my A. Okay, and it can also have an integer, y. And finally, just just because we're gonna do the same thing in C, so C is gonna have a basically a b my b, and maybe down here, that one we'll put something after it. So and actually maybe we also throw in a my a as well. Uh, yes, that'll be just fine. Okay. Now normally, if we do it like this, if we're trying to access uh, Put a return here, zero here, so we don't get random crap in throughout. If you want to make an object of C, we can say C uh, my C, and then if I want to access the the X inside of of uh, of my uh, of my A, I can do something like my C dot my A dot X, and if I wanted to uh, to access this the X inside my B, I can do my C dot my b dot my a dot x okay and i can set this to be 10 okay so now let's go ahead and run this make sure it compiles uh we forgot the semicolons Now, uh, it runs, but nothing happens because we don't really see out it, okay? But uh, we can add some see outs if, if you want. And then do the same thing for the other one as well. I had a dream last night. I just remembered that I was in Disneyland. And there was a hotel that was right next to it, but it was like a, it wasn't like a Disney hotel. And then Obama was coming to talk at the park. That's very random. <laughs> I just remember that. So interesting. Okay. But, uh, yeah. All right. So 10 and 10. So we got what we expected. Okay. So, um, 
let's go ahead and now make a pointer of C okay so let's go ahead and say C pointer I know I was actually gonna go to this and then March and then I got sick so I couldn't go and then then this whole thing happened so maybe that's why what is a CPT like that what ride did I go on I don't remember I but I did in the dream I went on like a ride I was just very confused in the dream why Obama was there in the park. I've seen Obama live before, so I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's why. But uh, okay. So CPTR, and so now we're gonna go ahead and try to access those X's. Now this is a little bit easier, but we're gonna make it harder. So let's say that we want to see, to to basically change the the the, the, the values here, because right now you know if we run this. By the way, this is a tip that you guys might not be aware of. Sometimes if your terminal is stuck, like nothing runs, you know, it's just flat out stuck, then just press con span control C and it'll be get unstuck. He was at UNOV like two years ago. Well, yeah, they had, no, 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 was he? I mean, they had, I know they had the debate, but I saw him in Las Vegas maybe like 10 years ago, actually. Um, while he was still president at the time, and he was, he came here to campaign for, for whoever was running for office at the, point, at the time. And they went to a, to a, a park near UNLV that was a school. It's a long story. I, I don't want to get off topic. But I I met somebody there who who hooked me up with passes and I, I like VIP passes. And so I was like like five feet or ten feet. No, yeah, like five feet away from Obama. So I was like, whoa, like it's cool. So uh, yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> and at that time he was president, so like <laughs> security hazard, I guess, if they don't trust me. I think I was a citizen at the time already, but yeah. So I guess it's not as bad. Um, but anyways, so we are gonna go ahead and get and make this point to my C. And so now from here, we are going to try to change the values of, of the two X's there, right? Because right now if we run it, you can see that there's two tens there. So those are still there. But we're gonna try to change them to like seven and eight. Okay, so the trick here is, you know, let's do it the wrong way first. We just try to, or, or let's do it the naive way. We just basically do cptr my dot, um, and you can see it's not even autocompleting at this point. My a dot x gets nine, or I said seven and eight, so I guess seven. Okay, so right now what, what I'm thinking is, well, this points to my c, so I can just treat it the same way. I can just say my a dot x, like I'm doing here. I can't do that. I'm going to get some errors here. Let's look at the errors. Request for a member my a in CPTR, which is a pointer type. Oh, and then we get this little thing that we'll come back to, which says maybe you meant to use that. And actually, that's going to be one of the solutions that we'll talk about. But uh, we're not there yet. You know, we got to show you the hard way first. So that's basically the problem in saying it's a pointer. So then I'm like, oh, okay, let me throw in the asterisk and hope for the best. Run it again. Now you are getting basically... Ah, the same actual wait did I did I save it did I get the exact same error even though I put the oh yeah I did because I can, you can see it so it's still complaining right so then you know that's because the dot is taking higher precedence so I can put parentheses around this and now I'm okay you can see I changed the seven and I can do the same thing with the uh, with the other one I just copy and paste this at, th at that point, I can treat this as the my C part. So the, the rest of this, I can copy and paste from here. So this doesn't look too bad so far, right? I mean, like, well, make this something else. If you, because I guess that's seven and eight, right? So this doesn't look too bad, right? Like, okay, I just got to remember, I got to put these parentheses when I'm dealing with pointers. You just wait. Let's make this even more uh, interesting shall we say let's go ahead and make the my a inside of b or uh, yeah let's make the my a inside of b let's make this also be a pointer okay like that yes 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 and so now that it's a pointer we of course need to allocate it so uh we're gonna use our new here and say new a just to allocate it Yes, indeed, parenthetical hell is coming indeed. And uh, yeah, we'll do that for now. Okay, we'll, we, won't, we won't take this deeper than that for now. Let's do, let's do this one, okay, just like that. So now, 
Okay, this will be a little bit interesting here. So uh, in this scenario, now there's my A here. So here, let's comment this one out for now. This my A here is now a pointer. It is no longer a variable. So if I try to run this again, it's gonna come out and tell me a bunch of issues about the value, right? Request for member X in my C, which is a pointer type. And yet again, it's keep asking me about this arrow thing. Yes, this is one of the solutions we'll talk about once we get to it. <coughs> but of course, right now we don't know that that exists. So, uh, but see the compilers, homie, they're, you know, they're trying to tell me like, yeah, use this thing, don't be weird. But uh, you know, we're not listening. We don't read the compiler errors. So uh, we just we just grind our way through this. So anyways, we're gonna, you know, this is a pointer now. So I'm like, well, okay. My copy paste solution would tell me to just do this, right? You would think that that would be the same thing because that's what I did here. I just put a bunch of parentheses, right? Well, nope, that doesn't quite solve it because it turns out that you really got to think about how this works for you to understand what's happening here. What we need to do first is we need to dereference this as a whole but included with this. So it turns out that you actually have to put the dereference operator outside here. And then you want to put parentheses around the entire block here. Because what's happening is you want to treat this entire thing as a pointer, which you then dereference. Because that'll give you basically the value of where my A is. So in here you have the first layer. Oh, hold on. That has to go inside actually, like that. But here you, you have the first layer that is basically just to get to the my C, which is a pointer. Okay, so CPTR level. But from there, that is gonna get you into the struct C. Um, oh, good point. I actually meant to do this on under this one, actually. Like that, okay? So uh, from there, you know, the my C here, this is going to go in here and look at the member variables, right? So, uh, I could actually, yeah, I, I could, I could leave if I, if I actually switch this back to how I had it, with the, the V category here, then I can, I'll, I'll come back and do that one later. If I do that, then this, this line of code should still run. But uh, here, all I'm doing, like I did down here, is I'm just getting into the C struct. But from there, if it's a normal variable like my B, yes, I can do the one that I'm doing beneath here, my B. However. If I'm dealing with the my A here, because this is a pointer, then I have to also dereference that. And I have to take whatever is here plus whatever that my A gets me and dereference that. So that is why you have this sort of weird nested uh, parentheses system, okay? And if you run this, then I think we should be good. Oh, fail. Let's see. What did I screw up? Uh, CPTR, my A, yeah. And then that gets A. Yeah, and then B, my A. Yeah, so that's okay. Uh, I don't think it, it saved it because it gave me the same error. My C dot my A, but I don't have a my C dot my A in here. Oh, I see. It's the ones above it. That's right. Yeah. So now I have problems with these lines of code because uh, <laughs> because they're using the pointers. So just ignore those lines of code for now, just to show you this. And then uh, now, oh, and then also I have problems here too. Yeah. Yeah. So because I made it a pointer, I gotta change the other parts too. So this this will no longer work either the C out. Uh, at least for the uh, the one that's dealing with the uh, with with my A. So because of that. We now have to change, change this guy to basically say, uh, well, here, let's change it to C out. So I got to add in the dereferencing as well for this, which happens to be like that. Okay. There we go. And then that's just complaining because we're not using C++11. If you really don't want to do that, let's go ahead and throw in a constructor in here. My A gets new A. Okay. Now we can segue our discussion into constructors with dynamic allocation in a little bit. Um, 
Oop, sorry, I hit the microphone. Hopefully it's not to show you guys' ears. Why is there a random zero there? Oh. My. Sorry about all of that. It's just when, I, when you're trying to quickly change things, you make mistakes. But there we go. Okay. So let's talk about what I had to do here to get this going. Okay. Because uh, it's not uh, trivial stuff at all. It is pretty complicated, actually. So the way that let, let's talk about this line first. Yeah. Let's talk about this line. So this line, I'm just dealing with my C. My C is not a pointer. So struct C is not a pointer in this scenario. However, it does contain one pointer, which is my A. To access that content, I basically have to use this method here, which is my C dot my A, but my A is a pointer, so I have to then dereference the result of that. Now, notice here that I don't need internal parentheses because the dot happens before this dereference operator. And this is why in the other scenario I need parentheses because here, my C is a struct and it's an, it's an object of a struct. And in that case, it has a member variable called my A. Doesn't matter right now what type it is, which is an integer pointer, but, or sorry, it's an object pointer, but it's just a type. So that is basically getting us to my A. And then if we are dereferencing that value with the asterisk here, but we want that dereferencing to happen before we get to the X. If we didn't have these parentheses, then it would basically be trying to dereference uh okay i guess i press full screen it was trying it would be basically trying to dereference the uh the x itself but the x is just a regular variable it's not a pointer the pointer is my a so that is why in this case you just need parentheses here but you don't need them here because if if the my c dereferencing happened first before the my a you will need to add the s you will need to add parentheses but here it doesn't here the my a happens first and so that is why you leave it like that. Now, the other scenario is this one up here. In this one, we have CPTR, which is actually a pointer. So by the way, I guess if you have the question to you is, how do I have to change this line to make it work with the current code? Yeah, let's go with that first. Because right now it will not compile. So how do I have to change this line of code to work? And the answer is just basically this, right? So that's why it was complaining earlier and I had to do all those fixes. So if we do this, then we won't see any different in the output, but uh, it did technically was 10 for a second before we switch it back. So um, in this case here, CPTR is a pointer pointing to my C and we need to dereference that pointer first. So that's what's happening with the first set of parentheses. And then you gotta go inside of the object, which happens to have a pointer of my A, you need to dereference that to get to the regular my A, and then you can access X, okay? Now let's go one level deeper. Let's make this a pointer. Let's make my B a pointer. So in this case, I gotta do my B gets new B. And now inside of B, there is a my A, okay? We're gonna leave that like that for now. We'll just, uh, actually, no, let's, uh, yeah, let's leave this one regular first. We'll make it a pointer in a second. First, let's make the my the b here a pointer so let's make this one a pointer and then let's make a constructor here that says uh my a gets new a okay so now we're saying the struct c has an object called oh i changed the wrong lines i meant to change that way yeah so c has an object not a pointer just a regular object called my called b my b and that, however, has a pointer of my A, which then is just a regular object, okay? So now, if we're trying to access the X in instruct A via the B here, just as we were doing here, then this line of code will no longer work, okay? The way we're gonna solve this line of code is we have my B, this part is okay, because my C, is not a pointer and then my b is not a pointer but my a is a pointer so we need to add the parentheses here before that last member access operator uh, is there and then that way that will be okay 
um, assuming, well, now we got to fix the same thing. We got to copy and paste this code into the C out as well. So down here, like that. Okay. And we got one more somewhere. Oh, oh, well, we got to change this one. But here, let's comment this one out for a second, just so you can see that this is working. Okay, so we got 7 and 10. But now we want to change that to 8 via the pointer. So this is where things get a little bit nasty. So my A is now a pointer here instead of my B. So we got to dereference that before we get to the X. So we got to put a parenthesis here, and then a parenthesis here. And inside of that, put the dereference operator. So it kind of looks like the one above it, but they're a little bit different because in this case, we have a my b in the middle. That's not a pointer. And then we get 7 and 8. But now for the ultimate trick here, we are going to make my b a pointer too. So now we have a pointer inside a pointer inside a pointer, basically. So there's some pointer inception going on right here. Okay? Because we have c that has a pointer of B. So that's one, le one level of pointers potentially here. And inside of B, there's a pointer for A, another level of pointers. However, C itself is a pointer now, so we have three levels of pointers. So in that scenario, uh, here, we got to change this line of code because now my B is a pointer, so we got to add another level of parentheses like that and make sure that we don't break the other parentheses as well. So we got my C, which is not a pointer, but my B is a pointer, so we put that. And then we got these guys. Okay, so yeah, so there we go, that's good. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this into the C out statement as well. And let's comment this one out, since now it no longer works. And let's see it. So we got seven and 10, right? So this is, this. let's look at what we did here. So my C is not a pointer, so there's no parentheses there. But my B is a pointer, so that's why we have the dereference operator like that. Again, that doesn't need pointers because the, the, the member access happens before the dereference. Then we need to access that my B as a pointer. So we need parentheses there with the dereference because we want that to happen before we go to my A. So then we dereference that, then we go to my A, and then my A itself is a pointer, so then we have to dereference that whole thing to get to X. You may have to rewatch this part of the video and uh, listen to that again. Finally, let's make we're use, let's, let's use our, our C pointer that points to my C. So that one is going to be the ultimate thing. So in that one, C is a pointer, so we need to dereference that as we have already done here. Then my B is a pointer, so we got to dereference that one as well. So that one takes care of basically. Well, here let's get here. Let's delete all of them first, because otherwise we'll get confused here. So let's start out with that. Obviously, that is bad, right? That will not work. Let's start out. So C is a pointer, so let's go ahead and dereference that first. So put the parentheses and put the dereference operator. That takes care of, of C. You got to do the same thing for B. So put parentheses there, put parentheses there, put the dereference operator there. And then we got to do A because that's also a pointer. So put parentheses there, put parentheses there, and put the dereference operator there. And finally, we get to X. Okay? So uh, as you can see, this is pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. And it works. Can we go deeper? Yes, we can. Int x is a normal variable. Let's make it into a pointer too. So now, because that's a pointer, we need a constructor here to initialize it. So let's just say x gets new int. And now, I guess just so we can squish this all into one page, so you can see it all, let me go ahead and uh, Put it all in one line like that, the constructors. Uh, this one. Don't do this, of course. It's not a good practice, but I'm just doing it to squish the text as much as possible. So you can see it all in one line, at least until there. So, like that. Okay? There we go. You can see it all in one page. So uh, now, because this is an X, none of this is going to work right now. Like if we're, we're trying to run this, we're going to get like a 50 different errors here. So yeah. What we need to do is this is this is a pointer now. So we need to dereference that. So uh, dereference it. Do we need parentheses there? We do not, because 
the dot is going to take precedence first. So we don't need to do anything else there. Then uh, for this one, similarly, we just need to put the asterisk. So that means that we got to do the same thing with the C outs. So just throw in the asterisk. I'm not copy pasting this time. This one also needs to have asterisk and then asterisk. And now we should be good, I think. And there you go. It works. And if I comment these two lines out, you will see that they're both a 10. So 10 and then 7 and 8. So yeah, as you can see, this is uh, pretty hardcore. Um, however, there's a, there's a systematic way of doing it, as you saw. And as long as you follow that systematic way, then you should have no problem, right? It's, it's easy, right? <laughs> So, uh, is there a better way of doing this is what you should be asking yourself right now. Or do I have to switch majors, you know? <laughs> I'm joking about that. But uh, the answer is yes, there is a better way of doing it. And it has to do with all these little warnings that we got before with uh, did you intend to use this? Because there is an operator that is going to come to the rescue. Okay. And that is going to be known as the arrow operator. So let's switch over to the, to the thing here. So we don't like having to do this thing, right? We don't like having to do this, this parentheses asterisk thing. Cause I mean, as you can see, things get chained as you go further deep into this pointer madness. So, it's very hard to keep track of all of those, those uh, parentheses. It's very bothersome. Like as a developer, the idea is code is supposed to help you out, you know, work with you here, It'll make code easy to write. Not like hard to keep track of all these parentheses. You're not using scheme, okay? You want, if you want to go hardcore with parentheses nested, you go with scheme. That's a language where if your code doesn't compile because parentheses don't match, you just keep adding them until they match and then hope it compiles and actually works. So, uh, or interprets, I suppose. This is interpreted language, I think. But uh, yeah, we're not, we, we're not using scheme here. So the solution is going to be a little like, ah, arrow operator. It's actually called the member access operator arrow. I think that's the official name, but Everybody knows it as the arrow operator. Oh, oh, I'm, I am showing the video. I thought I hadn't switched back. So arrow operator, okay? And uh, yeah, it's very, very cool to use because uh, all we're gonna have to do now is instead of writing this line of code, you know, I'll put it out here again, as ptr gpa gets 10, or oh, sorry, it's not, uh, that's not a valid GPA. I mean, I guess in theory it could be, but that'd be extremely hard to do. Actually, no, it wouldn't. It would be impossible to do because there's no way to get anything with a ten. Yeah. Um. So you would basically do SPTR arrow GPA. It's so much more clean crisp clean okay so the too long didn't read or didn't watch version of this part of the lecture is and I have it like that here literally TLDR is to access members of a structure so a class or a struct use the dot operator to access members of a structure through a pointer use the arrow operator let me show you think you'll appreciate it how we can convert these two lines of code into using with the arrow operator let's start actually with the second one which is the nastiest one I think this is the nastiest line of the entire code so far we can do cptr arrow my b arrow my a arrow x and then I suppose since x is a pointer 
we we will have to probably put in the asterisk here I think And there you go. I can comment this line out if you want. I mean, it's they're both doing this. Okay, well, here I'll I'll make this uh, change it to nine. How about that? Just to show you that it actually worked. Semicolon. You guys are very quiet today. Hope you guys are alive. Legolas bullet. I've never seen the Lord of the Rings. So, I mean, I'm assuming that's a Lord of the Rings kind of thing. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that is the solution to uh, you guys are here. But are you mentally, like, in the heart and soul here? Or did pointers take your soul away? So, uh, yes. Is there any way to remove the star from 926? Uh, nope, not really, because this is a pointer. Right, and if you have a pointer, you know, remember if we have the most the OG pointer like this, you know, new end, you know, and, and you want to and you want to store something in that pointer, you have to use that. So that one you can't really get rid of, you know. That one you're forced to keep. Um, but hey, I mean, look, this is so much nicer. Like, if we had another variable here that was like an int y that was not a pointer, then this would just be basically like cptr my b my a y. Okay. And then uh, we can see out that here. Actually, we used 10 already, so let's just let it. So yeah, this is why I didn't want to make a video of this. I wasn't live because I'm assuming you guys would have questions. Uh, and I gave you the operator overloading one instead. But there you go. So that one, you, you the little asterisk. But I mean, it's important to understand why you don't need parentheses, right? For that one. Because again, the arrows take higher precedence than the asterisk. So it basically, the way this process is, you can think of it as going here to here to here to here and then gets the asterisk at that point of time okay that's the last thing that it'll do it goes that way or I guess you're looking at a video so it goes that way okay I don't know why I gotta get used to the whole pointing thing backwards but uh, yeah okay yes point to your soul uh -huh. so um, I guess we might as well change this one up here as well CBTR my a x and of course put the little asterisk there again you could have extra asterisk if you feel better about yourself that way like that uh, actually not in that one you don't want that to happen first that one you kind of have to put it here you know there's no choice but uh, you know if you wanted to for some reason put asterisk like in here you know like that I mean you can it's like in math if I put parentheses where I don't need them but uh, yeah, uh, what did I break? Where well, I forgot an asterisk at some, some point somewhere. Uh, oh, I forgot a semicolon. That's what it is. So there you go. But anyways, I'm gonna get rid of this one just to. Actually, no, I'll leave it. But I'll leave it like commented out, so you can kind of have it there as a souvenir. Uh, so both parentheses and arrow do the same thing. Well, I mean, yes, but understand the difference of why I need all these parentheses thingies and asterisk. So basically, yes, they they assume this to be a pointer, and then they 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 make sure that it dereferences as a pointer. So I would say yes. Basically, this line of code and this line of code do the same thing. You are absolutely correct in that. But be careful about just kind of assuming it to be that way because it's a specific combination of parentheses and asterisks that do the same thing, right? If I just throw random parentheses in random order and random asterisks in there, you know, it's not going to do the same thing, right? So it's a specific combination that would. So, uh, yes. So, yes, I suppose the way you put that, the template like that. Uh, so if you have, oh, here, I guess that one is better to draw than put here. So, yes, so, but you are correct in, in thinking that... Uh, you know, whatever it is here, 
dot whatever is here is the same thing as that that but again my risk of just saying this is remember when you get to the la to, to two layers of pointers you know technically that you know we'll call this one two one two one two three this becomes one two three right so it's a specific ordering right i just don't want you to to naively think that this is actually this you know that's not that's wrong okay this one's wrong put like a thing like no, no smoking sign kind of thing okay that looks horrible okay let me try that again maybe a cross okay so yeah so the error is just to clarify the order of operations no the arrow is a substitution for doing a specific order of operations that's a better way of thinking about it you have to really get practice with it to get a feel for it um, that's the best I can tell you that's why uh, you used it in assignment 4 it was introduced that's why it was in the animal assignment but you will use it pretty much for the rest of the semester I mean frankly you want to use it like I, I know sometimes you learn something and you're like I don't want to use it I'd rather use my way no this is not one of those cases this is one of those cases where like literally the arrow is so much less painful to use than the parentheses like I I know so many people that get things mixed up with the parentheses and the stars so would the one you crossed out be one star two star three star um if the one I crossed out what this will be trying to do if, if it was a variable if it was actually something of this format would be oh gosh basically well let's say that this is a variable too this would basically think that b is a regular object and would get the location of c so this would work if there was a class b you know and b was an object of that class and then there was a c in there and c was a pointer maybe like an integer pointer okay if that is the case then this part would work okay which will be the next thing that happens and then all of that stuff is apparently a member of a class a which doesn't really make sense so that's what happened there and then whatever that is it would get the references if it was a pointer so that's what actually that would be interpreted as. So all of that would just be a mess and probably never a scenario that you would actually use it on. So, but I mean, hey, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big if, you know, maybe you find some weird code that actually would do that. Uh, so, yep. I'm actually, I'm top of page for all of that, but it's okay. So we talked about no, and then I have a dynamic variable stuff. Did we talk about delete in detail? I think we did, but I don't know if I showed you uh, deleting an array. So we'll, let's talk about arrays. Uh, the next thing I have in here is a allocation of uh, an example of a memory leak and dangling pointers, which I do remember talking about. So uh, in that case, I think that's pretty much all of this will do for us. So let's go ahead and switch gears and talking about arrays because eventually we are going to be throwing in arrays into this mess that we've had, right? But before we throw arrays into the mess, let's just make arrays themselves separately and then we can put them in classes, okay? So I'll go ahead and just leave this be, let's save this and make sure it still compiles. That way you have it. And uh, yeah, uh, by the way, in the past, I asked that as an extra credit question on the test, and uh, in one of the semesters, very few people got it right, actually. It wasn't exactly this format, but it was very, very close. 
Um, that's all I remember. And then I put something kind of easier like this on ABAT, and people still got it wrong. <laughs> so I, I historically, what I'm trying to tell you with this is that it's a very hard topic that you guys should really uh, focus on trying to understand. Okay, it's uh, it's not easy. It's not trivial, at least for somebody who's just starting programming. So don't feel bad if you're like, what the heck? That's, that's, that's expected. You must embrace that so that you can transcend it and learn it. So uh, it'll take time, but hopefully, like anything else, with practice, you will become more familiar with it. So uh, it, it is expected for you to struggle with pointers a little bit, at least with this kind of level of pointers. You should all be able to do the basic pointer, like this, you know, like what I did here, you know, new A, yeah, that's trivial. Okay, so uh, moving on. And I did post on Discord all of these of last week, because uh, you, you reminded me, it's funny. And uh, if you remind me again on uh, Thursday, I will post that. By the way, we do have an exam coming up on Thursday at class time. So we will not have class on Thursday, instead we will have the test. So uh, that will be done on Canvas, and I will be posting the test at some point tomorrow. Yes, because I just finished making my 219 test, and I, I give that one priority for some reason. And uh, this one I will do next. But uh, So we will talk a little bit about the test maybe on Wednesday, if you guys remind me to stop class like 10 minutes early. So, uh, yep, okay. And this stuff will be on the test. Uh, to probably pointers will be the last topic. I will, but I will on Wednesday because right now I'd rather get through this stuff. So, uh, or I mean, you can ask on Discord somebody who's taken class with with me before, or somebody who took one thirty five, and uh, they can tell you the, the format of the tests. Um, so let's go ahead and make an array of of uh, a dynamically allocated array. So. And then from there, we'll, we'll work our way to a two-dimensional array and then a three-dimensional array. And I think we'll stop there because there's no, usually you don't go bigger than three dimensions. And if you do, then you can just use the same pattern. You see the pattern that kind of emerge from the 3D. So uh, obviously, of course, if you want to make an old-school array, so an OG array, you do something like this, right? But you have to give this a compile time. I know some of you get away with doing something like CNX. Um, and then you put an X here, but technically that is not good. That's because that's actually uh, not not okay with the with the way that the language is designed. That has to be converted into dynamic array. It's just that the uh, the um, the compiler basically does it for you and uh, kind of you know, it's let it letting it slip because it's like oh okay I know what he's trying to do. But it's not really, I mean, if you were to try to print out the addresses of the uh, array, actually, that's a good question. Now you know how to print the address of just any, about any variable, right? So if you, uh, if you want to print out an address, you could say something like OG array one. We'll have to make it bigger than one, right? And when I print out the address of that, then we can just put the ampersand. make it five so there you have the address that it's allocated at and I'm actually surprised it's not in the uh, it doesn't show it as if it's in the stat in the heap but I'm pretty sure that this is doing things in heap because you're not giving it a defined size but anyways that's the old school arrays now I'm going to show you how to properly do dynamic allocated arrays which is how you should properly do arrays that you don't know on compile time what size they're going to be and uh, the way we're going to do that is we are going to start out with a pointer that is going to be the name of the array. So we'll just call it AR. From there, you know, we know that if we did this, it would allocate a single integer. However, if we put a square bracket here and then put in the size, which can be read from the user this time, but I'm not going to read it in just to not have to type enter each time I run the program. But the point is that if you're making this dynamic, it's because you're making this a custom size. Okay, so this is not something you're hard coding. Otherwise, it's a static array. So uh, by doing this, you're basically telling the compiler to dynamically allocate an array of size 10. Uh, basically, uh, 
ready to go, whatever you want to put in it. It's, it's garbage in it, you know? Let's see where that gets stored actually in memory. That looks more like the heap, see? That looks, see, I don't know this one, it's still saying it's not a heap, but it's dynamic, so there's weird stuff happening there. But as you can see, this is on the heap for sure. Uh, I think the other one should be too, but yeah. So, um, you can go ahead and uh, insert things into your array as, uh, as necessary. As in 10, let's make a size here. I don't want to hard code this in case I want to change it later. And then uh, if we want to print it out, you can do that. I will do it in the same loop, why not? Also notice that even though it's dynamically allocated, I'm still able to access it pretty much uh, the same way that I could access a regular array, right? I'm not have to use any the reference operators or ampersands or anything like that. Um, that's pretty nice because uh, if you really hate the reference operator, then I guess you don't have to use it right here. So uh, when you're ready to deallocate this array, you know you can't just do this. You can't just go ahead and say delete r. Because then it's just going to delete one spot of the array. And then, well, of course, you want to set it to null afterwards because you're a good programmer. You don't want dangling pointers. You know, you want to make things inaccessible for people. If you run this, you know, it runs okay. Uh, that's pretty scary. That. Uh... Oh yeah, that's why I see why. Oh wait, I guess it's a good question. Why did I get zero x four here? Why did I get that? Why is the address of array one? Four. You guys tell me. Printed the address of an integer four bytes. Well, Yes, the integer is indeed four bytes, but why did I get four and not like an address like this one? Why did I just get four flat out when I printed the address? And I guarantee, I could bet you $100 that if I run the program again, I'm gonna get the same value again. Even though, you know, if I was to go ahead and do this before here, I get an address there and that changes, but the four doesn't change. I think you got it, that's right. Isn't it because you nulled and deleted R and then see out of the address, that is absolutely correct. So yes, R has zero and because R has zero, then the second element of R will be found at wherever R's address is plus four, which would be zero four. So that is indeed correct as to why. So uh, remember that arrays, at least the way that the, that the that the you see it as a programmer and, and you always kind of could hide how this is really stored you know it's keeping it in a nice little contiguous lock of memory and if this is the spot of the first element you guarantee that four spots later if it's an integer it's going to be the next spot and the next spot if there's a double here if i made this instead of an integer array a double array then you would expect this to say eight here so yes i'm kind of glad as a uh, was, what's his name? Bob Ross. Yes, as Bob Ross would say, it's a happy little accident, right? <laughs> that we had that, so we could see it. Okay, so uh, you know, Bob, there's a there's a Twitch channel that just broadcasts Bob Ross 24/7. I saw that like a, a couple of months ago, and I just ended up watching a full episode. It's kind of cool. But anyways, uh, check out Bob Ross if you've never seen him before. So, um, so here we are uh, deleting the array, but what I really wanted to show you is Balgrind's output. So remember Balgrind is what you use to check for memory leaks. So uh, right now, interesting, I, uh, 
I have a mismatch delete. So, so it, right now it's actually telling me that I have no memory leaks. However, I do have a memory leak. And more than just a memory leak, uh, I have a big brother memory leak. And yet it's not catching it. But it is giving us an error. So maybe the, that's a good sign. So when you run Valgrind, you know, you want to look at the errors as well. And so uh, it'll tell you where the error happens and then your output. So like you could have some output here and then some output beneath it. And that'll actually kind of help you find where the error is based on where in your output it is. For those of you that debug with print statements and stuff, that could be useful, I suppose. Uh, so here we have mismatch free delete and delete square brackets. Um, address that is zero bytes inside a block of size 40. So I'm assuming that this error is because I, because think about it, block 40, right? 10 integers, each one's four bytes, that's 40 bytes. So that makes sense, this is block 40. So it's telling me that this address is a uh, is zero bytes when it should be 40. So I think basically TLDR is telling me that I'm that I'm trying to delete that. But I'm interested, I'm surprised that it doesn't say it's a memory leak. It's just an error. However, if I run it again and I fix that, I no longer get that error. So while the error is a little bit, well, the leak summary is misleading because it says I don't have memory leaks, but in reality I actually do. Uh, it, it, it technically uh, it technically did catch that something was wrong in the context of an error. So that is why both you need to make sure you have no leaks and no errors. And the error kind of hinted to us about the fact that there was a it was mentioned in delete, mismatch delete, and uh, the fact that the size of the block, you can kind of compare it to the size of the array, and that kind of helps us to point in the right direction. Also the fact that it happened after we printed all digits out but before the program ended, means that the error is after this line, but before this line. So it kind of narrows it down to just a delete. So the long story short, when you're allocating an array, you don't just call delete, you call delete square bracket array. Now this is really weird syntax, but that's just what the C++ gods granted us with. And that is to basically uh, type that in like that. And that will deallocate a one dimensional array. But now let's escalate things. Let's make it a two-dimensional array. So a two-dimensional array, you know, at first let's kind of see what, what we can do. So uh, there's two sort of ways that you could think of a 2D array. And one of the ways is you could, you know, first of all, what's a 2D array? You have columns and rows per se. So let's say you have three rows and you have four columns right so you have a total of 12 slots you know let's say they're integers okay so if they're integers that's four bytes each so you have 48 bytes of memory okay one of the ways that you could store this the c way with malloc and things like that would be to just kind of put it all together in one long block like that and you'd have basically 12 of these. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I went to 1, 2, 4, 12. Okay? Just right. Because think about it. In memory, no matter what system you do, at the end of the day, main memory is just a really, really big table that has only one column and just a bunch of rows. It has potentially something like around the area of 4 billion or 8 billion rows potentially okay depending on the number actually uh well let's see if you got if you got your standard 8, 8 gigabyte or 16 gigabyte ram stick you know each of uh, each that each each one is four bytes so you really kind of divide that by four so you end up with four so yeah so about four uh four billion rows you're gonna be, you're gonna have in memory okay and each of those can store one integer approximately it, assuming you have the same 32-bit architecture or whatever you have 64-bit things change but uh, ultimately that's how it's stored in memory but that is something that the operating system handles you as a programmer have to figure out how you want to handle your own system of two-dimensional arrays. One of the ways is, of course, to flatten it, as you do in C. 
the other method, which might be a little bit of, you might think it's overkill, but it's actually the way that we're going to do it, is you can create an array here, just a regular array, could be dynamically allocated as well, actually. That in this case, if we're doing the example above, is has three rows, because that's how many rows we got, three rows. However, this is no ordinary 1D array. This is an array of pointers. And each of these pointers points to another one-dimensional array that has four slots per se and similarly with the bottom ones so each of those has fours and by doing this you essentially achieve the same thing as that however in main memory whereas in the first method you could think of this stored as sort of a big contiguous block of memory which everything tied together I could store each of these rows in different places in memory. So this could be like in the top of memory, at the bottom of memory, and so on. And so this is actually one of the ways that we're going to be achieving multi-dimensional arrays. That's the other method, that's the C way, but this is more of the C++ way with pointers. And also it allows us to kind of have big, 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 really big arrays without having to have a huge contiguous block of memory. So uh, that's the goal. And by the way, I still didn't quite talk about malloc yet. Um, did I know? I, I could have sworn I had notes on malloc somewhere. Ah, here we go. It was the last page. So I'll put this here so you guys can see it in the video later. Okay. But uh, if you want to create malloc, let me just show you a quick example before I show you the array. And we can actually make a, uh, let's make a 1D array with malloc actually. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So uh, first of all, malloc is, a C, is a, you know, in C++ you have new. That's, uh, that's something that uh, C++ added in. However, in C, the C programming language, which is kind of what C++ sort of was based upon, the foundations of, they did not have new and delete. They used functions to allocate memory actually and the functions were part of a library the library uh, I actually have to google because I think it's stdlib.h or something so that's why I'm, I'm gonna google it really fast see what the library is it is stdlib.h yeah sorry. I think that's what I said but if I didn't well now I did so include stdlib.h okay and so now we can go ahead and use these functions that are available to us and the first one is going to be malloc why is that under there we go so malloc how do you use malloc well you still make a pointer variable so in pointer and then instead of doing new integer what we're going to do is just basically call a function that returns a pointer to us a pointer returning function okay so you you have a value returning function which typically returns integers floats doubles strings even objects now you have a pointer returning function which returns to you a pointer how do you do a pointer returning function let's let's do that as well actually so let's make a let's make a function that allocates a new pointer how about that using new so let's make our, our fake malloc okay we're gonna call it fake malloc and our fake malloc just creates an integer. Fake int malloc, okay? Fake int malloc is going to return to us a pointer. So we do int pointer as a return value. And all it does is basically say return a new integer. Okay? And so now if we want to use that, you know, for, uh, let's say we want to use the size for that. So we're going to keep track of the size using a pointer so it'll be now a pointer and we're gonna put the size to be equal to 10 
And so now we're going to do int size gets fake int malloc. And that's going to dynamically allocate a integer. And then for now, just comment this out for a second, just to show you that that works. Okay, as you can see, we have allocated that. Of course, now if we ran Valgrind, we would have a memory leak. So let's go ahead and call our fake delete function. So in, in C, the function to delete memory, because you don't have a delete operator, is called free. So we're gonna go ahead and create a fake free function, which has to take a parameter, which is the, the whatever we're trying to free. So it's a pointer. So how do you pass a pointer to a function? Just the same way you pass variable. Like say you put a little asterisk because it's a pointer. So we'll call it PTR. And all we're gonna do is call delete on PTR. And that'll basically delete that pointer. So now if we want to just call that, we can do that by saying fake free and then pass in the size. And then if you wanna set it to null after that, you can do that as well since you wanna be safe about it. I know it's the end of the program, but you know, while you're learning the program, it might be a good idea to always set things to null just immediately. So you can develop that sort of muscle memory. And so if we run this again, we can see that now we don't have a memory leak, whereas before we had four bytes in one block. Now we have zero bytes and no errors either. So, yeah. Okay. So that's how basically malloc works. Of course, there's no delete in there. There's some nasty code, pretty advanced code. If you run a debugger, you can see it. But uh, let me show you how malloc, the real malloc works, because it takes more than just a parameter, right? Because otherwise, if we, the way we have it now, if we wanted to make a double, we have to do another function, right? And malloc has one function for all types. And the free, the free actually, the parameters work like this, but internally there's more work to it. So let's go ahead and make a single variable. So the way that you, uh, that you make the, uh, the malloc is you basically got to tell it how big of space do you need for this it doesn't know whereas new and delete know the type base because you tell it the type right here with malloc you're not passing in you're not passing in the type like you can here it's not an operator it's parameters you, what you do is you need to put a number in there so i could go and put something hard coded like this and this would work in my computer because a byte is four bytes. But if somebody else's computer, a byte is eight bytes, or sorry, an integer is eight bytes instead of four, or maybe it's two, then this will break in their computer. But in mine, it'll work just fine. Oh, that's that. Invalid. Oh, that's the other thing. In C, this would be okay. However, in, because what happens is malloc returns, as you can see here, a void pointer. A void pointer is a is a pointer that doesn't have a type. C++ doesn't like that being a thing, so they don't allow it. So therefore, because this is a void pointer, you got to cast it into another type of pointer. And that cast has to be of the same type as what the pointer you're declaring is. So you can go ahead and say static cast integer of that. Alternatively, you can also do, you know, let's make another pointer. We'll call this one PTR2. You can also do the, the C style cast, which is int pointer like that. Malloc uh, 4. Okay. So both of these lines of code are the same thing, just different syntax. I think this is better because uh, when we talk about reinterpret cast and dynamic cast, there are advantages to doing that. Uh, oh, ooh, accident. We're casting to an integer pointer, so not just an integer. I was trying to cast to a regular integer, but it's an integer pointer, so yeah. Okay. Uh, like that. Okay. So as you can see, it compiles and run. This is allocating. Actually, we allocated memory. So uh, if you look at the output of Biogram, you can see that there's there's uh, eight bytes allocated that we never deallocated. As you can see, the allocation worked. However, this is bad because we don't want to hard code a specific size for how much memory we're using, right? Because again, the size of the types may vary between different uh, operating, between different hardwares. And so because of that, 
there is a function that you can use called size of, which will tell you how many bytes a specific data type takes. And that can, that can be anything from a built-in data type to, I believe, pretty much any custom data type that will return to you. So size of, if you want to see what it gets you, you can do C out size of integer, and that will basically tell you size of an integer. And just, just for curiosity, this is the same thing for a double, so you can see that. And so if we will go ahead and run this, you can see that an integer is four bytes, but a double is eight in this computer. But if I run this in a computer that was different, then I could see these be different values potentially. Like I run it on an IAS computer or something. So uh, by the way, curious to see, let's make a string called str and just not put any, in fact, don't, just don't even put it, just speak like that. And let's call size up on that and see what it gets us. Hmm. It tells us 32 bytes. Interesting. However, what happens if we go ahead and just put nothing in it like that? We get 32 bytes. Okay, now let's just put a bunch of stuff in it. We still get 32 bytes. Okay, let's go ahead and put way more stuff into it. And we still get 32 bytes. Does anybody know why we get 32 bytes all the time? I'll tell you why. I don't expect you guys to know. But the reason is because inside of the string class there is probably another pointer that points to wherever it is actually being kept so the string object itself is 32 bytes but the string object itself does not contain the string it contains a pointer to somewhere else in memory where there's probably some sort of character or array that's dynamically allocated that's what really contains the string and that's probably a private variable that we can't even get get access to so uh, that is why it doesn't change regardless of how much stuff we have inside. Uh, you know, we, we could do str.length, but uh, I don't think anywhere in here we would be able to get that. Let's see, append, add, begin, capacity, begin. Capacity returns the total number of characters the string can hold. We'd have to see the string implementation to see. <laughs> I like the comment of this. This, this is it. This is handled to internal data, not modify or dire things may happen. <laughs> this is a very popular thing to see in code is basically a, a sign of bad things. So data has its own little things in it, a bunch of stuff. And uh, it looks like a vector almost. Uh, let's see, data has a reference to itself, I guess, I don't know. Let's see what that gives us if we see out that. That might actually be the, the contents itself, although I don't know for sure. We'll test this. If it doesn't work, we'll just move on. Uh, does not have a class type. Does not have a class type. Valid use of non-static member function. I don't. I don't know. But anyways, it's it's as you see, there's stuff inside of it. So anyways, that's why this gives us 32 bytes, and that's why we don't need to have that deal variable length because it's kept somewhere else in the heap probably. So uh, anyhow, as you can see, the size of function will return to us how how much space a specific data type takes. So basically, that's what we're going to feed into malloc. We're just going to feed in the size of whatever we are making, OK? Uh, in addition to that, if you wanted to make an array of uh, a specific data type, so let's say you know, instead of using new here, we want to create an array of size 10. We can use malloc for that. Cast it, I suppose. So cast 
integer pointer and then malloc and malloc we can do size of integer however that's only one integer although this will compile probably and run they might crash uh, well I might have wrong too many parentheses here size of integer that closes malloc and then that closes that one here let's try that again size of integer then close malloc then close the casting oh I see I'm missing the lesson sign yep I just saw it as your message came up uh, and then oh here get rid of the string things since I deleted the declaration cool Oof. So uh, the reason why I'm getting all of this is because uh, I created a single integer, but then I'm trying to fill it in with 10 different items, right? So I'm writing in places that I don't have permission to write that are after the array, or I'm sorry, after the first integer. And that's kind of what it's trying to tell me here about, oh, actually, this is actually probably more of an error related to the delete, because the delete is trying to delete an array, when it's not an array anymore so actually that's probably where that is coming from yeah so that big and nasty error is because we're trying to delete an array when in reality this is not an array this is just a single object and it just gets just goes hardcore and tries to delete stuff that is not it that is not belonging to it so uh bad things happen as you can see here so how do we make this actually an array instead of a single value? Well, if this gets us four bytes and we need to have 40 bytes, then we could just multiply times 10, right? So yeah, we just multiply times 10 in here and then call it a day. And now we just made an array of size 10. Bam, done. So uh, essentially, there is nothing more to it than that. However, if you want to, you know, use a variable instead of a literal here, you can use size. However, size is a is an integer. It's, it's a pointer, so we're gonna have to use this weird syntax, which just looks really weird with the two asterisks. Because here we have a multiplication sign, and the other one is a dereference operator. So that's actually pretty disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, uh, is it because Chinese malloc trying to delete? No, uh, that's that's something that I want to talk about next actually but uh that wasn't actually the reason why we're getting that error so let's talk about the the allocation first and then, and then about why you shouldn't mix them back and forth but this is how you basically create uh dynamically allocate memory using malloc and again you can just pass a size or you can hard code it but again the hard coding part is pretty bad so you want to uh put variables inside the malloc call okay so uh, again if you uh if you don't remember what I said, just take a picture of this part here, okay? So that's, I got a little labeled as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay, how to delete in malloc, okay? You don't want to use delete, you want to use free, and like our fake free, it's actually, I find a lot of people seem to mix it because free is easier. You don't have to worry about it's, if it's an array or if it's a uh, or if it's a single variable or a single single uh, no integer. All you do is put free and then put the name of the object. So like free ar. Done. That's it. As you can see, everything works out fine. That's pretty much all there's to it with the free. Don't forget to set it to null afterwards. But here's the issue. People hate remembering that you have to use the square brackets for delete. And sometimes they don't remember if something is a single integer or if it's an array. So they are like, I'm just going to use free because it covers myself, right? That's not a good thing to do. Do not ever mix new and delete with free and malloc. Free and malloc are C. New and delete are C++. 99% of the time, if you mix them, nothing bad will happen. It's that 1% of the time that you should be worried about because it'll come at the worst times possible. Bad things will happen. So that's all I'll say is don't mix new 
and delete with free and malloc. If you're allocating stuff in C++, in fact, you really shouldn't be using malloc and free in C++ in general. The reason why I'm showing it to you here is just because it, it's a little bit of a good thing to know, but you really should only be using new and delete. But if you do happen to use malloc, make sure that you're matching the allocation for that is with free and not with delete. So don't mix back and forth. Bad things will happen, okay? So uh, bad, by bad things, I mean essentially your program will probably crash or uh, have memory leaks or other weird and unexpected behavior because internally, they're not the same at all. You know, they're totally different things actually. They're just communicating for the heap for memory, but that's kind of where the similarities end. So uh, yeah, that's my, that's my little warning about using free and uh, delete. Okay. So um, going back to the array, let's go ahead and make that 2D array, shall we? So uh, uh, yeah, let's just make it in here, I guess. Let's uh, no, 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 no. Let's make a new file. Cause I kind of like I want to leave that with the malloc in there for you guys. So dynamic array to that CPP. Okay, and now let's just have a main. And then let's just make sure we switch over to the other file. Any questions, by the way, let me know. Okay, we are now ready to rumble here. Okay, so let's go ahead and make this to the array. We are going to be making it the C++ way, which is going to be the array of pointers. Okay, so we are going to have that first layer of the array is just three pointers. And then each of those will point to each of the columns, okay? So because of that, we are going to basically create our dimension variables. So we're gonna call them uh, uh, rows and columns. Rows is gonna have three, columns is gonna have four. And then, uh, Let's go ahead and allocate that first layer. So that first layer of the array. We're gonna call our array just R. So we'll make a pointer called R to maintain that array. We carry as many spaces as possible so you can see everything nice. And now we are gonna say R new integer array, but it's not just any kind of integer array, it's an array of pointers, so integer pointer array. And then that is going to be the size of the rows. Next, we are going to create each of the columns here. Okay? So each of those, the ones here. To create those, we need to have three separate new columns. So first we're going to put them all three by hand, and then I'll show you how to put them in the loop. So right now, if we, in fact, right now, if we wanted to print out, so here, let's just a little, if you wanted to just print out what is contained in each of the uh, columns or rows that we did, we can say CRR like that. And these are just pointers. So there should be addresses, garbage addresses, but addresses nevertheless. So let's just confirm that. Uh, rows not declaring the scope. Oh, rows. Here. Cannot convert int to int. Oh, yeah. So things will get a little bit more complicated with that pointer there. We actually needed to make it a pointer of pointers because right now. 
if we were to really draw what's happening is we have ARR. That is a pointer too. And that pointer is actually pointing to the first item of this array, which itself is an array of pointers, right? Which then could points to the first element of this array. So really, these are what your pointers are holding. So this is holding the address of this guy right here. And this here is holding the address of this guy. And what is this one holding? It's just a regular integer because that one's actually the data. And because this is pointing to a pointer essentially, it's pointing to another pointer, then it has to have two asterisks because it's a pointer to a pointer can also be called a double pointer, but some people don't like that terminology. So that is why ARR has to be put with two asterisks instead of one. So now if we run this, as we, I think we already did, oh no, we have it. We can see that it has zeros. That happens to be zeros because um, it happened to initialize it. it was, I guess it was nice to us. It, for some reason it initialized those addresses to zero, but they are addresses nevertheless, okay? So furthermore, in fact, maybe if I draw a random variable here, we might get those to show random stuff. Nope, didn't, okay, whatever. So now let's go ahead and allocate those columns here. So let's make the ones, the horizontal ones there. Those are gonna be new malloc calls. We're gonna do ARR zero. Oh, I don't know what just happened there. Okay, um, I, I think I switched to, to a different input source. So, uh, yeah, so anyways, now we're gonna have air zero, which is a pointer. We're gonna have that have its own new array of integers. Those are actually integers, because those will contain the data of the number of columns, okay? And we're gonna do that essentially three times for uh, all three, all, three, all three rows. And each row has to contain four items, which is why columns is that. If we go ahead and do that, yeah, I think I switched scenes in OBS. We can now see that they all contain different addresses. Now, interestingly enough, the addresses here are separated by 32, uh, 32 byte, bits, bytes, 32 bytes. Oh, thanks guys. Sorry about that. So uh, that's what you meant with different scene. Sorry. So let me. So basically, I went ahead and created an array. Uh, of, well, yes, an array. I went ahead and for each of the three uh, entries in my array, which are just pointers, I am allocating a call an entire array for them. So each of them points to a new array. So that points to a new array. That points to a new array, and that points to a new array. So we got three arrays. Each of those is of size four. That way we can have a three by four like we were had in the iPad. And so when I run that, you can see that uh, well, you, even though they're in different places in memory, they're all separated by 20 in hex, which is actually 32 in decimal, so 32 bytes. And that just happened to be the way that it is setting it up here because uh, technically uh, each of those columns is only four times four, which is 16 bytes. Um, however, here it's it's uh, putting it as, as it's 32 bytes. So I don't know what's in between them, to be honest. Uh, we can investigate it a little bit. But yeah, this has essentially created a array of pointers, which point to tiny little arrays. So we have now achieved this so, this sort of symbol. We have AR up there pointing to an array of pointers, which each points to a 1D array. And so now let's go ahead and populate our array. So to populate our array, we can use the for loops as usual. So i is less than as do rows, which is less than uh, wait, wait. so which which one do we have outside? So now in theory, it's kind of weird, but we have the outer dimension to be rows and the inner one to be columns. So yeah, okay. So i is equal to zero, i is less than the rows, i plus plus, 
and then for int j is equal to zero j is less than the, the columns in this case j plus plus and then in there we are going to go ahead and say ar i j and then we'll just we'll just say we'll, we'll put in there i plus j okay just to put in some data and then let's go ahead just to show you i'm going to do it in a separate for loop even though i could just do it inside of the same for loop although this one i'll compress i don't need actually the parentheses see out on end line oh, hold on yeah like that okay oh let me get rid forgot to get rid of that part and you can see here we got a little array going on here and it, it actually worked out it's just kind of hard to see um actually i know how i can kind of get to show it to you better just add those parentheses back in so i can do an m line here and then switch this one to be a space like that and now it looks more like a like actual what we were looking for initially so it looks more like uh this right that three by four and there you go there's just random values in it but that's just because i did that i could have initialized them all to zero i can switch this to be zero if you want if you want me to uh do that i just wanted to put something other than zero because it's more interesting that way you see that but yeah that's uh how you do a 2d array dynamically allocated you basically just uh, make an array of pointers, which then point individually to uh, to to arrays, to one D arrays, and everything. Okay. Now the other trick is how you do deallocate this. You can't just do this. It's not enough to just say delete AR. That is not going to delete everything. I mean. If you it looks like everything's okay, but when you run Balgrind, you're going to see context errors or memory leaks. Balgrind. <laughs> so 48 bytes in three blocks has been lost. Because it turns out that Balgrind can only delete the, the, the nearest sort of context of the array. So you can only delete the array of pointers, but it can't delete the individual ones. So the way you delete the individual ones is you actually have to call delete on each of the spots like that. You have to have four deletes essentially first go you work your way from the so when you're building it you're building it from the outside in when you're deleting you're deleting from the inside out so first we delete the internal columns like that and then we go ahead and we can delete the uh, the array of pointers which is an AR and finally the last thing we want to do is AR itself is a pointer so uh, we, while we have deleted what it's pointing to, we want to make sure that we set it to null so that we don't have a dangling pointer. And if we do that, then we will see that we have no more memory leaks. So the last thing that I want to show you today is how to make this in a nicer loop because this could be put in a loop and so can the delete. So let me just transform this code into a loop. Okay, so how we're going to do that is we're just going to write a little for loop here. Basically, the outer for loop of the uh, of the one that we have beneath there. I, I just saw that there's a plus here, and that bothers me. Looks kind of misleading. So there we go. Okay, problem solved. Um, and then now that we have our little for loop, all we got to do is basically take this line of code and throw it in here and just switch this to an I. Okay, and so now we have just one line of code. Of course, this is better. If you imagine you were doing like a 20 by 20, you know, you would have to have 20 individual lines, which would be horrifying. So, uh, yeah. And I guess if you want to want to show what this stuff is, we can do the C out as well in here. So we can keep the same output. And similarly with the deletes, uh, you can also do a little for loop. So 
I'm just gonna copy and paste actually the for loop. Make this be the I. And then don't forget to have that last delete in there as well. So that should do the exact same thing. We should basically see the same output as before. As you can see, we get pretty much the same output as before. And if we run Balgrind, we have no errors and no memory leaks. So there you go. That's how you do a two-dimensional array. Next class at the beginning, we'll do a three-dimensional array. And then we'll show you, I'll show you how to put these arrays inside of classes, which should be pretty straightforward. And from there, we can move on into talking about constructors and destructors and how you can use them to do your allocation and deallocation as well, which I kind of did today. You know, I didn't really mention that I was doing it, but I was, you know, when I did the uh, the A new, X new int, you know, I was dynamically allocating them. Although if I run this program, you would see that uh, there's memory leaks all over the place. So, uh, you know, lots of memory leaks. So maybe next time, what we will basically start off with, if you guys remind me, please remind me, I'll show you how to fix these memory leaks with destructors as well. Otherwise, I'll just show you a generic destructor example, but maybe we can actually go back and fix those memory leaks as well. So, uh, any questions? I gotta fix the, the green screen stuff. It's doing weird, weird things. Yeah, so that looks weird. But yeah, any questions, guys? Let me know. Let's see. So that kind of gets rid of some of it, but I have to mess with it. Perhaps off topic, but are we getting a study guide for the midterm? Uh, not really. What you get is a, a list of topics, which you already know, which are going to be classes, inheritance, uh, aggregation, and pointers, and operator overloading. But uh, your study guide is your homework assignments essentially there's nothing that i could put in the study guide to like i'm not going to ask you you know it's not that kind of class like where you you know we're learning a bunch of terms from a book and then asking you like a multiple choice question not really still a bit confused on the upper overloading when i watch the video first yes and as you do the assignment i think you will you will uh, understand it better as well Cool. I'll try to fix this green screen issue here. It's it's very nice when I'm here. There's no artifacts, but when I move away, it starts to get this, this the the aura, and it fixes itself. Interesting. Oh, I'll have to mess with it. I should have not messed with it. The problem was I messed with it, and now it's broken. So it was fine before, but then I figured that was the light. It says going to have definition questions or what I'll be coding debugging. There may be some conceptual questions. So uh, there may be things like, for example, what, when should you use inheritance and when should you use aggregation? Like what's kind of your, you know, what what is your, uh, your deciding factors for that? And then you can talk about that. So it's not necessarily a define what inheritance is. You know, but it's more of like, do you understand when to use inheritance and do you understand when to use aggregation and when not to use either one? Uh, there is no, there is no, there is no lecture on test day because you will be taking the test. So like no one will be here watching the video. So uh, yes. Oh yeah, that's a good point. So I will go over that tomorrow. So I will go over a deep and shallow copy tomorrow. Uh, remind me about that actually. I was going to get to that today because what well, we kind of needed to talk about arrays first. So we will get into sheep and deep and shallow copy.
Is there going to be multiple choice questions? No, it's all open-ended essay questions and coding. So, yep. But thanks, yeah, so remind me about that actually, because I, I hope, I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm probably, Try to, I'm going to put it down here on the, on the list of topics, you know, the little thing I have at the top of the page. So, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll do that. I'll put that in there I'll do it right now so I don't forget. But uh, Cool. Will we have the whole day to take the test? Nope. You will just have those two hours to do it because those are the ones that are officially designated. Apparently, if I go off track of that, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad thing. and I don't get, quote, unquote, in trouble, but... It's not a good thing to do apparently because uh, what I can do is I can give you extra time after that time but it's optional time not required but I, but I, I cannot just give you the test at a different time because then people can complain and say like well you know I, I have work and I can be like well yeah but if you register with a class with this specific time then you should be able to have it available so I'm kind of controlled about that so extra time at the end you will see that but I can't give you time before or at a different time or make the test in general be longer you know are we going to use lockdown browser no the test is open notes open book just not like shareable with people so uh i suppose that might be quite useful to have an ide set up and ready to go for the coding side if you guys took 135 with me yeah we have to use lockdown browser and that was horrifying uh not just what we had the webcam too so I, I well I don't <laughs> that'd be creepy. But Canvas has the footage of everybody who took the class. This one we don't have to use that, so I'm not using it. Uh, like I said, we will talk about all this stuff on uh, on Wednesday. It's easier to talk about the test once you actually have the test done, so then I can tell you guys. Because right now I'm just basing it off of what I think I'm gonna make the test like, you know. But like. Between now and then, you know, things things might change. I might change my mind. I don't think I'm gonna randomly add multiple choice questions, for example, but I could change my mind about what I put on there or not. So I have to make the test first, guys. Like I said, I would have made the test, but I made the 219 test yesterday instead. So I'll try to make that test tonight or tomorrow. So uh, we have to use Sally. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, I would really avoid using Sally during the test because like, what if it goes down? And it can happen when you got at least 20 something people logged in at the same time trying to take a test, you know? All it takes is one guy to run an infinite loop program and then basically kill Sally. So uh, I would frankly just have your own local IDE and compiler running Ubuntu, like that VM or, or a Mac. And. Uh, I don't think we will run into the situation where like my code will compile on your computer, but not necessarily. We're not putting those level of questions in. You know, it would just, I mean, I wish I could, but I can't make you code like assignments three in uh, one hour, you know, it's not really doable. And I say one hour because there's more than just one coding question in the test, right? So uh, yeah, but like I said, we will talk about it more. You can also ask questions on Discord, but like I said, let me do the test first. Otherwise, like I'm just guessing here what I'm gonna do, you know? I gotta make the test first. But like I said, I kinda have an idea of what I'm gonna do. Yeah, for the most part. Like I'm not gonna change it from like what I've done in the past, essentially. I'll probably actually use those tests as the basis and then just tweak some things around and add, you know. Yeah, I usually change the programming questions and whatnot. So cool. Alright then. I will uh, I will do the test, I guess. That's probably that's actually my goal tonight to get the test done. So yeah. So after you make the test, you're going to give some tips. Yes. But first, I got to make the test. I redeemed the extra credit a second time. Do I still get points? Yes, they do accumulate. You get 100 points each time. So just another DM on Discord. Make sure. Yeah, if all of you that redeem points today, send me messages on Discord with your names again, even if you already did in the past, because it's so much easier for me to just like open. Oh, that's interesting. Open, uh, open, oh, see your messages and then open Canvas versus trying to like look in my history of messages and see who you are. I'm not going to do that. It's too much work. I get so many DMs from people, as you can imagine, from questions, uh, not just this class, but 219. So it just makes, it makes things a lot easier. So yes. So like, for example, first assignment was 300 points, right? So you get 100 now, you do it again, you get a second 100 points and so on. So after three times, you basically got it the same amount of points as assignment one. And so on. But assignment one, you get to do the remake thing. So there's that too. I got it. Really. 
The problem is I need a better set, setup than, than this, you know. You can probably see what it looks like. So ready to see what the, the real world looks like without green screen? That's what it looks like. As you can see, uh, it's waving with wind and there's a crease in there. So, uh, yeah, I don't have a very good light set up here. So, yeah. Problem is that in front of me, I got a balcony to like a downstairs area. So I don't really have anywhere to place lights. So the lights are just kind of impromptu lamps and things like that. I would love to have a better setup, but my computer is just in a loft area, which is, again, with a little balcony. So that's also why there's echo, if you guys have noticed. Like, I have a nice microphone. It's just there's a lot of echo because of the room. I don't know. Maybe if, we, if, if fall goes online, I will, uh, since I'm going to build an EPC, I will just keep this old PC and move it to a room and then do better setup. I could do that, but the green screen itself is being held with two tripods and like clothes hangers. I, I don't know. If, I could probably put something around there. I'm only, I also have to move it back and forth. I can't even leave my office unless I move the screen. So it's a trick. I'll, I'll check that. It might be a good idea with the light bars. I just really need to light that side of the green screen. Like I said, it's when I move back that you can really see it having issues. Anyways, I uh, if you guys let me go, I can make the test. Otherwise, I won't be able to make the test. I'm going to write down before I forget the things that I'm supposed to talk about tomorrow. So, uh, constructor. Constructors. Destructors. And then deep and shallow copy. Cool. That way I don't forget. Okay. Anyways, all right then. Well, uh, I shall see you guys tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day. Get get the assignments done because that's that's going to be your best way to study for the test. If you can do the assignments, you should be able to do the test. Like, not going to be harder than the assignments. So, thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>